Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Buck Sexton Show. We're joined by Mike Cernovich. He is an independent journalist, commentator, filmmaker, a man of many talents and abilities, and has a lot to talk to us about today. Mike, first time on the show. Welcome, sir. Thank you, my pleasure. So, I gotta ask you, how are we doing these days on the right? When people ask you that question, or when you think about that, what are the first things that come to mind? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is they did win a midterm with the House, and they did get a popular vote majority, which mattered, of course, before the current time, right? Well, they won the popular vote for the House. That's the good news. The uh, the other good news is the Senate is looking good in 2024. Republicans can retake that. The, you know, on the other hand, there's a lack of purpose and mission caused by an obsession with the 2020 election that like just won't go away. So you have a number of people, myself included, and I'm becoming more of a dinosaur who says, I mean, of, of course, every you can read about the JFK ele- election. You can read about Bush versus Gore. Democrats had their opinion on that, of course. But you, you have to move on or you have to have some kind of solution. You can't dwell on it. And the right is currently obsessed with it and will not let it go. And anyone who doesn't think that's the most important issue is a traitor, controlled opposition, not ready for the moment. And that's people saying that is a large percentage of the voting base. That's a huge problem. And I don't know what, if anything, is going to be done about that problem. Yeah, I was going to ask you what you said, a huge percentage. Uh, what, what percent of the GOP base would you estimate, based on your interactions with them, are completely and unalterably, at least for now, committed to the idea that Donald Trump won in 2020? And therefore, a replay of 2020 in terms of strategy, candidate, everything would be to our advantage. I would say ten to twenty percent. Yeah, that would be my that would be my and, guess as well. Do you, is there what would it take? I mean, so so when I have people, for example, calling on radio, and I'll bring up, um, I think Georgia is a perfect uh, microcosm of this, right? I I think there are some states where you can look and see and say, hold hold on a second, we were able to win all but a race that was very much associated with uh, Donald Trump and with uh, 2020 election issues. And I'm not somebody who thinks it was a clean election, but to me that becomes irrelevant at some point, unless we're talking about fixes to the election. Do you think there's anything, is this an unfalsifiable claim now for many people? The 2020 election was stolen and therefore it doesn't matter. We just have to have Donald Trump again because he'll win this time. There's so there's two elements to that. One is the people who I don't think are annoying who say, hey, man, it was taken from Trump unjustly. Let him have another rematch. I don't actually get upset by that point of view. I don't agree with it. I think it's wrong. But that's within the realm of reasonable discourse. But there's fortunately, it's not 10 percent, but it's probably one to three percent who would say, well, Buck, you bring up Georgia. But that's because they, the voting machine people, let these Republicans win. That's what they'll tell you, that there's control now to a level of granularity where they can say, okay, we'll let this guy Republican win and that one win, but we're not going to let that one win. Those people drive me insane, honestly. They, not insane, but they annoy me the way internet spam annoys me. And there's no reaching them. That, that's the, the bigger problem, too. So within that subset of the 10 to 20 percent who think we have to redo 2020 is, say, a percentage of people who you, they, they're not open to reason. You can't say, hey, look, we just had an election. Barely won. Why they barely won? Well, Florida, that map, we, we now have people attacking DeSantis's redistricting map in Florida, which is the only reason the House has a majority. Right. Because Lee Zeldin pulled a few people up in New York. DeSantis is actually in federal court or will be soon because when the Florida legislature drew up the map, it didn't give Republicans much of an advantage. But because the state had changed, it was an unjust map. DeSantis said, no, we need to do a new map and did a new map. So there's barely a Republican majority. That's because of Zeldin and DeSantis, not because of Trump. 
Trump seemed to have dragged down people who couldn't let go of the 2020 election. And that would be the logical case that I make. No, they're having, you know, they're having none of it. Can can I ask you, you know, as a guy who I think certainly became known in conservative circles in the Trump era and relating specifically to 2016 and, and, and the rise of the Trump movement, are are you accused? Like what, what what are people who are very, who are so pro Trump that they don't want to hear or they don't believe some of the arguments you're making is the response that you've you've turned on Trump? It just feels like you would have the credibility to say, I still think a lot of what Trump did is great and I appreciate Trump, but I at this on this issue, I break from some of the narrative. Right. It, it, do you get any leeway for that? Well, I do from people who know. Right. You, you don't see a lot of people who are insiders saying too much because what I say is actually true. But the funny the funny criticism of me is and this is, again, because of maybe the way that people are spoken to who are Trump voters. You're either Trump or you're never Trump. And if you're never Trump, you're the the dispatch. And the no, what do you do with a guy who is hated by the never Trumpers, despised? I'm sure you knew, especially in 2016, I was hated. And because I was pretty ferocious, I ruffled a lot of feathers. 2017, still pretty hated because I was pro-Trump and I was knocking, metaphorically knocking heads of these dishonest conservative Pied Piper leaders, right? So to me, if I were Trump people, I would be worried. I would say, okay, we know where Cernovich was. He's not there now. He's so far over Trump and we need to find out why and we need to fix that. But the answer is that they don't want to engage with reality. So the reality is I sent you an article from 2017 Foreign Policy Magazine. So people go, you know, especially people who are new to politics, go, Cernovich, you're never Trumper. You're a nobody. You're a loser without Trump, you're nothing, blah, blah, blah. And and here's all I got to say. I was under federal investigation by the National Security Advisor, H.R. McMaster, because my reporting into the sabotage efforts directed at Trump were so truthful and effective that they wanted to shut me down. The Ukraine whistleblower who came up during that impeachment trial, I reported that this person was looking to, to get Trump set up on something or to figure something out or to find a way to get Trump out of office. I reported that in 2017, the name and everything, which you can't even say. Lo and behold, the name resurfaces and, oh, the same guy that I said in 2017 was gonna gonna be a problem. Oh, so two years, 2017, two years later, now you're in trouble for something that I warned you about. So when people come at me with these ridiculous slander at this point, the the idea that, that, um, that I am a never Trumper who doesn't know anything. And it's, not, it's actually the opposite. I was such a pro Trumper and I was explaining what was being done to sabotage Trump when he could have reversed course and they didn't want to listen. So then in 2018, I was said, I'm pretty much over this guy. There, there's no real point in, in doing this, right? Did, What's did, the point? Did the Trump agenda, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Mike, I just want to, I mean, did, did the Trump agenda get subverted by people that Trump brought into his orbit or was the apparatus and the deep state and the and the Democrat media just too much so that the promises were not able to be seen through, right? What Was it within Trump's control or was it external forces that are too much for anyone to be able to break through to fulfill all the promises or even the biggest promises of the agenda, build the wall, for example? Well, you know the answer to that. You were at Trump, D.C., and I'm sure you heard, because we are there in the same era, the same thing that I heard is the only way to get hired in the Trump administration is to prove that you were a never Trumper in 2016 and 2015. That was the quote unquote joke. If you want a job in the Trump administration, you better prove that you were never Trump during his campaign. And we saw over and over and over again who, who they put in charge of things at State Department. You know, you can talk to people like Amanda Millis is still loyal to Trump. She still called him the president. She's still loyal. But you can ask her and she'll tell you, because, again, what I say is not dishonest. They'll all tell you, oh, yeah, the people who are put in control were all never Trumpers. And people would go and say, why are you hiring never Trumpers? And Trump would just sort of raise his hand, you know. Sh- yeah. Sh- how uh, how did that hand. happen, though? You know, you were there. How did that happen? How did never Trumpers take over the Trump administration? Seems seems bizarre. 
Trump never had any interest in getting into the weeds of how you create administration. Now, the excuse for that is, oh, when you come from the private sector, you hire people, everybody shares a mission, everybody wants to make money. Oh, poor Trump was naive, which I hate that line. I'm 45. I don't know how you old you are. 41. But if you, talk, yeah, if you talked about me like that, I'd be insulted. Oh, poor Mike, helpless little baby. He didn't know. He's so naive. He didn't. I would be insulted. And that's how people talk about Trump, like he's a geriatric. Oh, he just didn't know how vicious it was going to be. Well, he didn't. I mean, he had people telling him this. People like me were telling him this. A lot of people, probably people like you were, were telling that to him or his staffers at the very least. So the, the whole, oh, he's just, he just never cared. He never gave a crap about sitting down and saying, okay, I'm the president now. What can I do? How do I make this happen? He fell right into the trap when firing Flynn with the Russiagate stuff. He, he was distracted by all of this, these chaotic landmines going off about him instead of saying, why don't I just hire people who like me and support me? And then, of course, Mike Pompeo started getting the security clearances pulled of Trump supporters. I was reporting that at the time. Didn't matter. He wasn't protecting his staffers. They were getting walked out from the National Security Council one by one. It was like a joke, like, oh, who's getting fired today, right? Rich Higgins, rest in peace, who you know succumbed to various medical conditions a couple of years ago was walked out of the National Security Council, brilliant guy, because he was too hard on China. He wrote this memo explaining how China, all this is true now. If you go read the Rich Higgins memo, everything he said is true. So Rich Higgins was warning people about the Confucius Institute. He was warning people about how China's subverting the country via you know university. And for that, he got fired, walked out. So why, why are people getting walked out? Can well, I just you know, tell you one, 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 one thing that, even when I was in the CIA that, that I used to say, um, when I, when they found out finally that I was leaving, they reached out and I, I had, I didn't leave under, I wasn't angry or any of that. I just got honestly a cooler opportunity for me at the time, which was to start a media career, uh, which I wasn't looking for, but it found me. But I just remember telling them, I said, you know, guys, and this is now, this is from an analyst side to be fair. But I, I said, one of the problems in our business, and I meant this in the whole national security, national security sphere, uh, overall, if I was in DC, I'd say writ large, cause everybody in DC has to say writ large all the time. It sounds serious. Um, but one, one of the things was that being right in the, in the long run, I mean, to be truly right, doesn't matter. It's being right in the office with the policymaker at the time of the discussion such that they like you and they want you back. The incentives are all wrong. And just to what you said about your friend, it doesn't matter who's right about the WMD. It doesn't matter who's right about us. China it doesn't matter who, what matters is do the people making the decisions like you when you're a CIA officer, when you're an FBI, you know, senior counterintelligence guy, whatever. That's that's why you have this. This this plays out time and time again, Mike. Yeah. And people were explaining that to Trump. But again, he had no interest in learning this. So that's why I, I bring up. I hate to be the old guy. It was well back when I was in high school. I scored four touchdowns. That's not what this is about, right? The, the reliving the glory days. Those are actually quite quite stressful, actually, when the entire intelligence community has singled out you, a civilian, for political and or worse style assassination. So it's not like a glory day. It's more like I put my neck on the line. All of these things I reported came out to be true. All of the excuses people make are not excuses. It's not Monday morning quarterbacking for me in 2022 to bring up 2017. When in 2017, I and other people close to the president were saying, hey, you got a problem here. You got to get rid of certain people. Your, your loyal people are getting fired. They're trying to completely rework this into the Hillary Clinton National Security Council. You better you better handle your business. Right? Can I tell you one of my frustrations, Mike, real quick about this is, is that please. Trump brought me in in May of 2020. I thought it was because I was one of the first people to say, and there were some others, you know, my friend Jesse Kelly, and there were a few people who very early on, April of 2020, were like, this is crazy, open up, no mask, this is insane. But I thought he wanted to talk about COVID. He wanted to talk about the intelligence community and some of the top people who were still in that I knew, you know, either personally or um, or well enough that I could weigh in on. And it was kind of funny. Now, granted, Trump thought he was going to get four more years, so I respect. But there was a part of me that wanted to be like, Mr. President, you know, you know me, and he'd known me since I was a kid. He'd actually, Trump and his, and his kids had known me since I was 13 or 14 years old in New York. So you bring me in now? It's been four years. You're asking me, I could have helped him avoid 
some of the deep state bear traps that he walked into. But he didn't ask my, little old me didn't ask my opinion. You know, he brought in, look, he brought in a bunch of swamp guys. He just did. And so, you know, I sit here and I'm like, I, I, you know, it's like if I were, you know, you're a dad. I'm hoping to be a dad soon. I just got married. If I told, if I wanted to tell my kid, hey, you know, run this play on the football field, but he won't even listen to me. I can't even say it. And then he gets just annihilated and sacked and loses the ball, loses the football. That's how it felt to me. It's like, really? I, I don't know. Yeah. That was frustrating. Yeah. Well, no, it's really, I didn't know that about you. And that's even more uh, annoying to me because you, <laughs> right. So you're, you're at the Trump DC hotel. You're hearing the same things that I'm hearing, Yeah. which is, oh yeah, so got walked out today. Well, why? Well, because some Clinton appointee wanted the job. So they got rid of the Trump person and they put a Clinton person in there and the intelligence community is indistinguishable under Trump than it would have been under a Clinton presidency. And you're like, oh, another one. Wow. So it's like Friday night. <laughs> it, 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 like every Friday was a Friday night massacre. You're at Trump, Trump, the Trump Hotel DC. And oh yeah, that oh, I'm out of a job now. And then of course there was no soft landing for those people. So you saw this. You yeah, know all of course. This. You you could have, and you know this, you could have just had Trump walk through Trump Hotel in DC when you know when it was Trump Hotel, when he was president, and just walk in, just people that he knew by sight and name, you know, you, me, others, and just be like, hey guys, I'm thinking about bringing this guy in or gal to some very senior, very important post. What do you guys think? And we could have said, you know, because we all knew. We would have said, sir, this is a person who, it's just about them. There's no, it's not about service to the mission. It's certainly not about service to your agenda. But some, that feedback mechanism, and I've tried to tell people this. I was like, every time I felt like I was trying to coach, and I have a much bigger platform now than I did during the Trump administration, to be fair. But every time I felt like, even from what I had, I was trying to coach Trump and the movement out of, out of love for what was trying to be accomplished, I got shot. I got shot. Why, why don't you believe him? 4D chess. Shut up. Why aren't you with him? I'm like, with him? I'm with him the way that, you know, the coach who's desperate to see his team win is with him. Like, what? And that feedback mechanism being broken, I think was, look, I think it's, it's why Trump isn't president right now, folks. I, I hate to be the one that has to say it. That's why we got. Four years of Biden and maybe four more, which I want to I want to talk to you about. It's like, actually, can we pause right there for a sec, Mike, while I I, I got to talk about our sponsor, but I want to come back to the Biden issue and where we're going. Uh, but my pillow is amazing. I love Mike Lindell. He's a great American and he's got this phenomenal uh, company. My pillow. I actually just ordered some more my pillow products today because they make the best stuff to help you get a great night's sleep. The, the deal right now that Mike has is on the Giza Dream Sheets. You should all have Giza Dream Sheets. They're made from the world's best cotton. Giza, ultra soft and breathable, but extremely durable. Right now, the Giza Dream Sheets are back at the lowest price ever. $29.98 when you use promo code BUCK. They also come with a 10-year warranty, and they're extending their 60-day money-back guarantee. So just go to MyPillow.com, click on Radio Listener Specials, and check out the flash sale on the Giza Dream Sheets. Use promo code BUCK. That's MyPillow.com. Click on Radio Listener Specials, promo code BUCK. Get the Giza Dream Sheets. Get a bunch of other products as well. All right, Mike, so I have another another uh, premise here I want to throw your way because, you know, look, I'm just going to say it. Mike is one of, for those of you who are on Twitter, Mike is, I think, one of the most worthwhile Twitter follows that you can have because you don't always know what you're going to get, but it is worthwhile. And I feel like that's such a rarity on the right these days. There's so many people who it's just, we're all like hamsters hitting the pedal, right? It's like the same, oh, this is what, you know, this is the talking point. This is the talking point. You know, you're you're with the movement, but you're not always align specifically with every individual part of it. And I, I find that interesting. And also we'll talk about some of the lifestyle and, you know, ph- life philosophy, I think is a better way of putting it. Life philosophy stuff that you get into. So I think that's really important for the right and just for all of us. But I believe that I believe that Joe Biden, you know, we spend a lot of time going, ha ha, he's senile and whatever. And look, I do some of that too. I mean, you know, poking fun is poking fun. Um, I think he's going to be formidable in reelection. And I think people that believe that this is going to be you know, that Trump, let's say it is Trump, that Trump comes back and he's the nominee and it's going to be a walk in the park for him. I think that's delusional. And I think we all need to be very honest that this is going to be a dogfight. Zero percent Trump wins in 2020 wow. against Biden. No, so. I mean, there's not, I'll, I'll yeah. take, you know, if you want to make bets. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about, you know, what kind of odds they want to set, because that'll be the easiest money that I ever make in my life. No, DeSantis, barely. DeSantis, it would be a close call. But because there are issues with, like, I'll give you an example. We, we don't need to go to the moon is made of green cheese or the infamous, there was a, a server 
I mean, you, I'm sure you remember as a former CIA analyst and people were saying there was a server shootout involving the CIA in Germany for votes yeah. in 2020. I was like, oh my God, yeah. we have a, we have a real problem here and I don't know what we're going to do about it, but they can't, I mean, they can run ballots more than once. You know, it's not hard to say, oh, we have a, you know, we're, we're running the ballots and you know that there's a certain district that's going to be heavily favored of Biden. You can't change it at the granular level, but you can say, oh, I'll run this one a couple times. There's, there's, there's nothing really stopping that. That's why you need more poll watchers, which was a big issue in 2020. The, the whole, the pipe burst in Georgia, and then suddenly the Republican poll watchers were sent away and there was no real solution for that. So there's a lot of things in 2020 that aren't going to go away and it's going to intensify. And that's why you need Ron DeSantis, who's going to say, hey, Buck, what do you think? What do you think about 2020? And you're going to say, well, there was no CIA shootout to steal the server. You know, the moon is not made of green cheese. But yeah, there are people doing double ballots. There are um, poll watchers. Our poll watchers were kicked out. That's going to come up again. There, There is ballot harvesting. That's going to be a big problem. They're going to these massive apartment complexes and maybe old folks' homes. So we need to start looking at addresses because they're filling out the ballots for senile people. A lot of that was shown in 2020, right? Oh, here's a, oh, you got 150 votes out of here and, and it turns out it's a senior living center, right? So there's a lot. And because elections are so close, everything like that really does matter. And you need someone who's going to focus on that. Well, this is the part of it that I, I also got very frustrated after 2020 because anybody who wants to talk about how we can find when there's illegal ballot harvesting, uh, ballot harvesting, find that, stop that. Anybody who wants to talk about mail-in ballot campaigns for Republicans, how we need to match, fight fire with fire, and say, look at Florida, look what Ron DeSantis just did in his reelection. Mail-in ballots can be done. It can be done safely and securely, but you need to get this stuff set up. I'm all about that. And looking for fraud and setting up systems to catch fraud, I'm all about that too. But whenever I say to them, at the end of the day, it's scoreboard. And if they put up the points and we can't prove that they cheated, thinking they cheated is one thing. Fine. Yeah, sure. I think they cheated, but I think they always cheat. If we can't prove it, we lose. And this is just where we come to. I mean, I had people in the months after the election, I'd be like, uh, and, and I, I don't mean when Trump is still in office. I'm talking about, you know, uh, let's say April of 2021. I'd say, oh, you know, President Biden, and I'd be at live events. They say, don't call him that. He's not the president. And I look at them like, guys, you know, he is the president. You can say he cheated and it sucks. And I wish it weren't the case. But like, you know, we, we got to we got to push through this a little bit. And I just worry that the thinking of of the, tw- the 2020 obsession is going to be a big problem for us in 2024. And I try to tell everybody, Joe Biden, look. Yes, everything you say about him, he's a clown, his son is a disaster, they're, they're criminals, they peddle influence. I mean, no one criticizes him and sees it, I think, more clearly than I do. I mean, other people see it the same way. But Mike, he's going to get 49% of the vote, right? I mean, that's where we are. And I just need everybody on the right to understand that because I see these polls. Oh, people think Biden shouldn't run again. Guess what? If he runs again, those people who are Democrats are going to vote for him without a second thought. We just had an election. That's what I tell people, too. People send me polls here and there, and I go, we just had a midterm, brother. Why are we talking about polls a few months after a midterm? Yeah. Right? That, that's how I feel about, oh, polls this. 61% of the country says that it's going the wrong direction. Great. We had an election, and 61% of the electorate didn't vote Republican. Right. We didn't have that wave that we thought. It was all very close, hotly contested elections. Um, Bobert almost lost Hersey. It was it was brutal. And again, without DeSantis and Zeldin, it very well may have been a narrow majority under Nancy Pelosi for another two years. So right. I don't know. the po- And this is, again, my biggest problem with the right. And, and probably this falls into my overall life philosophy. We if you have a, an audience, you have to be a leader and you have to lead your people in the right direction. You do not pander to their delusions because you want another click, you want another retweet or whatever. I've never pandered to everything I've said, even the things which are even the crazy things I've said are are aging better than maybe I thought. It's because I believe it and I wanna steer my people in the right direction. And telling telling our people, oh yeah, 61% Biden, wrong direct. I say, 
shake them up. Do you, did you not pay attention to what just happened? 222 seats. And it turns out Santos, we're going to just fa- plan on losing that one. So you need to just be thinking already, how are we going to get Bober reelected? She double recounts, right? Ba- barely. That's how close everything is going to be. Every vote counts. Orange County, they're still one seat shy of where it was before the ballot harvesting of 2018. So even though the the California GOP has gained ground and retook a bunch of the seats that were wrongfully taken in 2018, there's still a, uh, a, sheet, uh, a seat shy. I was thinking of sheets. I was thinking of the guys at Dreams sheets, actually, but it's the electoral seats. And that's what we have to do is just shake our people up. You guys you need to focus on the right issues. I, I think that's that's essential. Um, I want to ask a question. Uh, we'll, we'll hold because I, I have to have, have to give a word to our sponsor for a second, Mike. But uh, when we come back, I want you to address this. Why is Mike Cernovich considered so controversial? I, I, I want to. Can we can we get into that a little bit? Because, you know, I follow your Twitter and I'll, I'll sometimes say and even sometimes people on the right. Are like, oh, oh, I never get really. Oh, Cernovich. He's so controversial. Like, am I, are the are the people in the black helicopters going to come and kidnap me because uh, I, I follow Cernovich on Twitter and like some of his stuff? We'll, we'll get back at, back into that in a second. But the the Tunnel to Towers Foundation, I'm sure so many of you heard about it, does phenomenal work, really important work, keeping the obligation, the debt of honor that we have to America's heroes. The foundation honors fallen and severely injured heroes and their families with mortgage free homes. This year alone, hundreds of Gold Star and fallen first responder families with children and our nation's most severely injured veterans and first responders are receiving homes. More than 500 homeless veterans received housing and services last year, and more than 1,500 are receiving housing and services this year. This coming Memorial Day, all of the brave men and women lost since 9-11 in the War on Terror are having their names read aloud in a Tunnel to Towers ceremony in our nation's capital. Through the Tunnel to Towers 9-11 Institute, a foundation is educating kids in kindergarten through 12th grade about our nation's darkest day. Join Tunnel to Towers on its mission to do good. Please help America never forget its greatest heroes and honor our obligations to them. Donate $11 a month to Tunnel to Towers at T2T.org. That's T, the number two, T.org. All right, Mike. Cernovich. Controversial. Why do they come after you so hard, man? Well, what, what did you do to upset the, uh, the apparatus so much? Yeah, I often say I'm probably the most widely read person that people won't admit that they read because I'll say something no one else had ever said, and then all of a sudden that's circulating widely. And largely the reason I'm controversial or, or, or seen that way is in 2015 and 2016, I viewed the presidency as an existential crisis and stopping Hillary Clinton was the most important thing that I could have ever possibly have done with my life. And I didn't have kids. I honestly didn't care if that election killed me. I didn't. Where I was at the time, we ha- we would have been in World War III with Syria and Hillary Clinton won. So as much as I, you know, Trump this, all the criticism is buffered by the fact that we prevented World War III by working to elect Trump and everyone should feel good about the that for humanity. It was one of the greatest gifts that we could have given humanity in our lives. And Trump deserves all the credit for that. But if 2015, 2016, I was pretty mean. If you were a, you know, conservative was the term, like we we fought viciously and we weren't, we weren't nice to people. So I, I made a lot of enemies, which as you know, that's not a good way to be an influencer or a media personality. It's not good. Like lately, I think Jordan Peterson has been doing things to sabotage the right. Who's gonna criticize Jordan Peterson except me? Nobody can say that I'm wrong, right? Everybody in my notifications when I said, well, wait, why is Jordan Peterson calling out Christian Rufo and DeSantis for trying to reform higher education when Jordan's whole brand is the far left has gone too far? Well, okay, so, but legislative action is happening and now you suddenly have a problem. No one else but me is gonna say that because well, one, then you're gonna keep, you're not gonna be on the podcast circle, you know. I'm I persona non grata because Jordan Peterson is a you know perfect saint. But you notice if you ever read the replies, nobody says Cernovich, you're factually incorrect. They go, oh, you're jealous. His book sells more than you. Blah blah blah. Which is you know, and anybody who knows can attest. I'm not trying to ever get on anyone's podcast. I always say, find an email of me trying to trying to be on some someone's podcast, 
right? That's so far from where I don't want to do. But there's no one who, if I think you're steering the right in a bad direction or the country in a bad direction, I don't care how popular you are. I don't care if you have this halo effect on you. So I'll criticize Trump and Jordan Peterson in the same tweet. And then that led, that then I'm controversial now. Oh, Cernovich is at it again, rather than just say, oh, okay, well, but is he actually correct? Though? Is this, is this, this is a correct point. So a lot of it is vibe and aura. Cause I go, I mean, I go hard. I, that's why I don't play. Um, I don't ask for sympathy or a pity party. Cause I do go hard and people, people go hard back to me, but that's more where, you know, why people see me as controversial because yeah, I, I do go, I do go hard. If I think you're, you're up to something that's steering the right wing in a wrong direction, then I'm going to come at you in a way that other people won't. Speaking of the uh, uh, Jordan Peterson, I mean, one thing that I do think is getting a lot more attention there's Jordan Peterson. And then more recently there's been um, Andrew Tate, who, as I speak to you, is still in prison. Uh, they have leveled all these allegations against him. He's an American citizen who has not been afforded uh, time before a judge. They're just holding him. Um, he says he's innocent. The charges are are very serious, but we know that he was speaking, particularly in the last uh, six months or so, a lot about what it means to be a man, what young men should hear. And people say, oh, we said all these terrible things in the past. I say, oh, well, that, that may well be true, um, but there is still a need, regardless of any individual, regardless of any influencer, to look at the all-out assault on masculinity. And this is a real thing. We're all aware of it. That is underway. Toxic masculinity as a term is something that kids are learning in school and being taught that they should be you know, uh, aware of. Do you think the right is doing is beginning to do enough i guess say you know have we (laughs) the term woke you know is whenever i say have we awoken i want to be like oh well not wokeness but are we uh waking up to the all-out assault on masculinity and gender as part of the leftist program as something that is an intentional part of strategy that realization um was part of why trump won in 2016 because he was seen as someone who really kind of understood that. That's why I think that Trump's most recent uh, nasty comments about DeSantis is just gonna fail, right? Oh, here's DeSantis at a graduation party. And you're like, oh, okay. So here's a, a young DeSantis and doing a normal thing. And now, so now they're trying to flip that, which is what-, yeah. what I, I, By the way, I have, no, I have no tolerance for the Oh, he was a 23-year-old teacher who posed in a photo with some of his students and like it, maybe one of them had a beer. Let's let's charge him with some let's let's allege or, or insinuate some kind of sexual impropriety. That is that is bleeping garbage to do and everybody knows it. Yeah, and and it was a graduation party. So, you know, as you know now it's a different era, but yeah, you you go, "Oh, that's our high school teacher, come to our graduation party." That wasn't a weird thing. And if you actually, because the New York Times reported all of this and they said he didn't try anything, he didn't do anything. He just showed up to a graduation party. The kids are like, oh, hey, how you doing? How you doing, teacher? And he's like, hi, and walks away. And then the New York Times, the New York Times couldn't even turn that into anything, right? So if you go back and read, read it when they tried, everybody said, oh yeah, nothing weird happened. Oh, but in hindsight, he shouldn't have done it. Right, that's where they lend it to. So that just shows that people playing into that narrative, they're playing into the left wing narrative, which is that okay. So if you're a 23 year old or 22 to 24 year old man, and you're with an adult woman just in the room, you're a groomer now. Where'd that come from? That's left wing orthodoxy right there. So that's where the people have again lost a plot. That's not even going to work. But that shows how deep the memes are now, when people on the right don't realize, oh yeah, I'm actually being played. Or for example, the the Andrew Tate thing now, people are, if you go read those articles, boy, the headlines don't match what's in the story. The headline True. is, the latest, the latest BBC one I read was, oh, and I'm in trouble for the Andrew Tate thing too because we've had cigars together too. So that's another reason I'm controversial. So I've been embroiled in scandal after scandal where that because I've smoked cigars with Andrew Tate, I have to, you know, I have to either disavow him and convict him or I'm just like, well, wait a minute. Why don't you read the articles? The latest BBC article was a woman who said that, oh yeah, I did cam and he gave me half the money, but I felt like he manipulated me. Oh, and she had done sex work before and then she left and they broke up, right? So the headline is Andrew Tate, abusive boyfriend manipulator. 
And I go, okay, well, maybe this is finally, maybe they have something finally. And then you read it. And I go, wait a minute. So he had a relationship with a sex worker. He tried to get her to camp. She didn't want to. Eventually she did. He split the money with her 50-50. She decided the relationship was toxic. That goes both ways. Relationships with men and women are both toxic. That happens regardless of gender. And then she broke up with him and left. It's like, okay, but we're being told that the Tate brothers are the real life taken movie. That's the narrative. The narrative is they're kidnapping people. The narrative isn't that they're bad boyfriends. Yeah, well, it's hu- human traffic. Human trafficking is the allegation they're using. Human trafficking, which is a which is a heinous crime, right? Something people should go to prison for decades for. H- heinous crime. I mean, to the human trafficking allegation, I've also read in the just in the stories that there are people that are were allegedly human trafficked who are coming and going on video as they please with cell phones and buying designer handbags. So right. if, and, if, if that's, if that's human when, trafficking, I, you know, I, I do think you start to get to, well, is it the, is the coercive, is it just the psychological brainwashing creates the coercive force? But how do you measure that? Yeah. Yes, and we need to talk about that because that's the latest, that's the latest ploy. The late, because two of these, two of the women who are free and walking around, they're the victims. And a Ukrainian judge said, Oh, you've been brainwashed by the man. That's all left wing. So the left wing now, that's why I was so disgusted by Trump's tweet referring to the Santas and, and that is grooming. Oh, so we're the left now. And if you're an adult man with a woman who's 18 or older, you are now a groomer. Groomer is what happens to children, right? Grooming isn't something. That you do not. I personally, if I'm 24 and I'm a high school teacher, at that era, you just go to a graduation party because you don't think anything of it because you're actually not a scumbag, right? If you were a scumbag, you wouldn't say like, "Oh, take a picture of me because I want I want proof that I came right. to your graduation." It'd be the opposite. But that is lefting orthodoxy. Is they're going back now, and you can see this in in a lot of the cases and, and the theory. The theory is that. If you, you're, you're so man, your man brain is so powerful. And then by extension, the female brain is so manipulable that men are now emotionally manipulating women into doing things the woman doesn't want to do. And even if she doesn't leave, and in fact, by not leaving, that proves your man brain is so strong that you're able to exercise this mind control over you know fully formed adult women. That's where it is. Because yeah, these two women said, they were on video and they're like, oh yeah, you know, Andrew, he was nice. We love him and everything. And I thought to myself, well, you could find, how, how would I know this isn't just two random Romanian women? How do I know these are the two women in the court case? Because for me, I feel like I have a duty to present if the tapes are being railroaded, I have a duty to say something, right? So I saw that video and I even tweeted, how can I know these women are really his girlfriends, right? How do you know? And then you read the court. Oh, yeah. As it turns out, they are. They told the judge, we don't want anything to do with this. And the judge said, too bad. I I didn't realize, by the way, you were you were so up on this story. Do you believe the Tates are being railroaded? Well, I certainly believe, based on what I've seen, that the evidence is not matching the allegations in the media, because if you're telling me there are six victims and two of them have said we're not and you're saying we don't care. If they say they're not, they still are. Then that means that a lot of ple- uh, pressure has been applied, probably to the other four. I did see right? this, by the way, in one of the reports. There were women who have come forward who are considered to be some of the human trafficking victims who have told the court, and this is on record, or you know, told the authorities, I should say, police, that's laughable. We, meaning these two women, I think there were six. We were absolutely not human traffic, uh, human trafficking victims. That is reported right now. Right. So we know for a fact two of six say we're not. And we know the judge said we don't care. You are. So what's this say about the other four? Were they leaned on? Were they pressured? Were they real? Well, that's why I would like to see evidence. So then the BBC goes, oh, we met one of the Tate's old girlfriends and he's a terrible, terrible guy. And then I go, OK, well, let's read the article. And that's the article I just mentioned. Do you, oh, do you so think the Biden administration is putting pressure on on Romania in this regard, or is that is that just too far fetched? People have reached out to me to say they think that that is an element here. If you believe the Tates are being railroaded, and we need to say that's an if, 
do you, would you believe that the Biden administration may have a hand in that? I think that it's more subtle than that. I think that just like the DNC doesn't have to tell Twitter to take things down, take things down, the FBI does. I think with the Tates, you had guys who were trying to be basically tweet out rap lyrics, right? Whenever people go, oh, here's this horrible video with Andrew Tate. I say, you know what? If you're like me and you want to ban pornography and you don't believe rap music should be listened to because you think you're hypnotizing yourself to negative lyrics, if you want to ban I don't know what you heard about me, but I'm a PIMP from the radio, then I'm really interested in what you have to say about offensive videos. So we're gonna ban Snoop Dogg, the pimp. We're gonna ban all that rap music that talks about pimping, right? Oh, no, no, you don't wanna do that. Oh, you don't wanna ban pornography. Oh, well, that's interesting. So you, you participate in pornography or watch it, but then if a man is involved in the production. Now he's a groomer trafficker, even if the woman said she willingly did it. And if you talk like a rapper, then that has to be taken as true. But rap music, right? You see, there, there's no coherence to it. So what I think happened is pretty simple. You're the Tates, you want to get known, you make exaggerated claims, and then you start saying that you're bribing government officials that you're not really bribing. What do you think is going to happen? Right, that falls into the category of what do you think is going to happen? You're you're embarrassing people. You're embarrassing powerful people. In I, a I government. will tell you that th there are people on the right who, when Tate was talking about how the corruption works in his favor, and this just I draw on my background in the CIA and learning a lot about other governments, which is the most fascinating part of being in the CIA because obviously we got a lot of info. You know, other government we we do have more sophisticated technology. We do get a view that they don't want us to have, obviously. Um, and the one thing that will get you in trouble in a corrupt country is bragging about the corruption in that country that you say is in your favor. That that's like It's like the first rule of Fight Club is never talk about Fight Club. You're in a corrupt country, Eastern Europe, anywhere else in the world, and it's working out for you. It's going to stop working out for you the moment that you say, oh yeah, the corruption here benefits me. I think I think the Tates, that's a, that's a lesson from this process, irrespective of everything else, you know, the whether there's pressure being brought to bear uh, to bring these charges, et cetera, wh whether they're guilty or not, which I don't know and I don't profess to know. Um, but I do think that you don't want to talk about corruption in a corrupt country if you're, if you're planning on staying there. Right, if you're really doing it too, which makes me believe that they, it was just, I think it was just all an act. I thought they're, I think they're trying to be real life rappers they were they were mimicking what rappers say and that because if you're really bribing people and bragging about it then i have to reconsider my view of you right and there's nothing about the tapes that indicates that they're not that they're low iq right you can say they're evil you can say you can say whatever that's a moral judgment you can say yeah. they're evil but nobody has ever said they're not that yeah they're low I, IQ. I don't know tristan really but i mean i've just from what i've seen in interviews with andrew he's a he's clearly a high iq individual like that that is obvious right so, so if you're high iq you're bribing government officials would you brag about bribing government officials right that's kind of how i see it and then of course people who don't like the tapes have to wrestle with the corruption issue namely that the tapes were arrested in march 2020 they were released the next day because apparently video evidence cleared them. Then they get rearrested in December. Okay, so was Ukraine corrupt in March when they let them go? Are they corrupt now? Why aren't they being tried? Why are they being held? You know, because Ukraine has this weird system where you can be charged but not really tried. Is this limbo? Romania, yeah, Romania. They're, they're in Romania right. and they can be held. I think you can be held. I read uh, that you can be held for up to a year without actually having a trial. A year. I mean, now, yep. J6, J6 defendants can apparently in D.C. be held for about 18 months in solitary for, in some cases, nonviolent crimes. So, you know, we, we're going to poke at Romania on this one and say, oh, my God, oh, my God. But as we know, if you get on the wrong side of the deep state in this country, uh, that can happen to you. But you know, I, I, I wanted to ask you, though, on, on, a, more, on a more positive and constructive note, um, for young men, because one thing, one thing that I can tell does really rattle the left is when young men have this moment of recognition that the left wants them to be miserable, unhappy, weak, controlled, 
and, uh, you know, effectively, you know, l- low T, low IQ, do what you're told, triple mask, get your seventh booster shot and, you know, sit there, call yourself a male feminist. Uh, don't excel, don't exceed, don't, you know, uh, suppress all your masculine urges. And the right actually has people, by the way, like you and others who are saying, no, actually being a man is what you are meant to do. And that, that inspires, I think, young men. I, th- I think there's something important there. Well, that's where I had to thread the needle that I find interesting, too, about the Tate thing, because the Tates were giving a message of that I don't even agree with, which is, oh, you need a car, you need the watches, you need the swag. And I realized they were just doing that for marketing. So that's why I think the Tate thing is such a, an interesting phenomenon, because a right wing critique of the Tates would be, well, if you're chasing watches and cars, you're actually chasing left wing secular hedonism. Right. You're not you're not teaching. And I realized the Tate's did more and I'm going to have the Tate people mad. I love this because I'm going to have the Tate haters mad because they're going to say I defended him. And I'm going to have the Tate super fans mad because they're saying that I'm like somehow attacking them. Right. But the way I look at it is that we I you know, you don't ever see me fronting. You don't ever see me flexing. Um, You don't want to do that. What you want to teach young men is find your purpose, find your mission. You're allowed to have one. You don't have to live for women because too much of the a conservative Christian movement, unfortunately, is, oh, you're a man, you, you know, your job is to be like a pack mule, load yourself up. And well, where? That, that is not even necessarily biblical, right? So where are you even getting that in the Bible? So there's a, there's a third way, which is masculinity is about finding your mission, finding your purpose, waking up and trying to accomplish something, right? Trying to fight with the dragons, trying to, to wrestle with the oppression, trying to have some vibe, right? Some aura, so much of that, so much of it is a feeling. And that's what men not only need to be told, but that's what people like us have to try to model in our own way, which is, hey, look, man, you're gonna get beat up. People are gonna say stuff about you that's nasty. I've been attacked over Eliza Blue and Tate. Imagine the same three weeks you're attacked for allegedly the human trafficking thing, and then allegedly for knowing somebody who is allegedly maybe has an alternative narrative on her own trafficking story, right? And, but, you just, but that's where you just, as a man, you just say, man, this is part of life, right? How lucky it is that we get to do this all day and we get to take these attacks. Imagine how our lives could have ended up so differently or so much less interesting. And I, I, I do think, think that's important. I do think that the same way that if you believe in you know, the, the duality that is, uh, that is central to our existence, right? If you believe in heaven, you believe in hell. If you believe in good, you believe in evil. Um, with those, with the, with the basic framework for understanding our day-to-day lives in place, or our existence, I should say, uh, you're going to piss some people off. Because if, there are, if there's evil in the world, there are people doing evil, and if you're going to do something about it, you're going to upset those who are wrong. You're going to upset those who are making the world a worse place. So while you know, I, I don't go out there looking to stick my thumb in the eye of people. There are people whose hatred or disdain or whatever um, is a badge of honor. And I do feel that way. Right. And, you know, you're smiling. You do enjoy poking your finger. It's okay to admit that. You okay, know? That, that, okay. That's, that's it's okay. true. <laughs> it's, okay to tell, it's okay to tell men, you know what, conflict is good, but it needs to be conflict for the right cause. Right? It's, it's okay to have a little bit of indignation if it's righteous indignation. It's not okay to be a Karen. It's not okay to be crying over nonsense. It's not okay to, to hate women or to say because you had some bad dating experiences that all women are like that. Or it's, And it's not okay to just be a, a pack mule or let get walked on either. Conflict is okay, but you need to, again, find that purpose within yourself and then find out that it's a righteous cause. And then conflict is good and it's necessary and I think it's very healthy and it's very masculine. One thing I want to ask you about, you know, there's this trend I'm sure you've seen of of women uh, shaming men for a- allegedly looking at them in the gym, right? If you, you've seen this, and this has got a lot of attention recently. Uh, there's a lot of things I would say about this. I mean, I go to a gym down here in Florida where I'd never experienced this before in New York City, but there are a lot of women in the gym who are, and I, you know, I just got married recently too, so you know, I've got, got the blinders on. Um, but uh, there are a lot of women in the gym who are uh, influencers, um, some of them are known to other gym staffers, for example, as uh, having very uh, lucrative 
OnlyFans careers, uh, things like that. And so that's very common here in South Florida at certain gyms. You're just going to look at this. We're at, for people look a certain way, they have to spend a certain amount of time in the gym, and, and I get all that. Um, but I, I worry that women uh, are, are not being given good messages in a variety of ways um, about their beauty and that it is now being, it is now thought of more than ever as a commodity, meaning the monetizable that your sexuality and your beauty as a woman is a monetizable asset first and foremost beyond anything else instead of something to, yes, of course, be chair. You know, you have a lovely wife. I have a lovely wife. I would say, you know, you can trust a guy with a lovely wife. Um, but that's the, the point is actually to to appreciate beauty and to also to, to see it for what it is. And for a lot of these women, I think, to find a, a great, I, I mean, you know, we're supposed to say life partner, but husband. I mean, to find somebody to build a life with and attraction is important in all of this. And I just think that now you have a lot of these women who one are very insecure, even though they're very good looking because there be, there's a hyper focus on it because of social media. And two, it's just like an ATM machine now. And, and they wait until they're 40 and then they turn around. They're like, well, I'm so beautiful. Now I want my husband gets a lot harder. Well, it gets, yeah, it gets a lot harder for a man too. And that's something that I've noticed that when you watch videos, uh, one actually good TikTok trend is they go and ask older people, oh, how old are you? And they'll say, oh, I'm 65. What's 65 feel like? And one of the themes is that you see the world the same way, but you're old now, right? And if you're a man, you usually have more self-awareness and you realize, okay, I'm an, I'm an old, old guy now. And for oftentimes for women, it's harder to make that transition, which is in your mind, like, you know, you're 41, I'm 45. In our minds, we're still like 25, right? And that's actually how men get injured doing things because you're like, oh, I no, no. My wife asked me earlier to climb a tree. And I was like, I'm not going to climb that tree. She goes, well, I go, because if I fall down, I'm going to hurt, man. You know, if I were 20. We still there? Yeah. 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 Keep going. Yeah. And so the world looks at you differently. And a lot of people have to accept that. But as to the, the gym thing, it's like a lingerie show, man. Sometimes it really is ridiculous. One gym I go and I start going on a different hour because I don't, I, I don't want to just have those purient thoughts. Like I, I, I don't watch pornography. I try to avoid the IG. I change my algorithm so I don't see, you know, all that kind of stuff. I, I and think, I go, go ahead. No, no, no. I didn't want to interrupt you. I just, I, I think this is so important for men while, while, while promoting masculinity. And look, I'm the first to admit I drank too much in my 20s. I should have worked out more. I should have gotten more sleep. I, you know, 20s and into my 30s. Um, I, you know, th th there are some things that I would change differently about my behavior. I will say, I've actually never said this before on radio or on podcasts, but I made the decision, maybe it was about 15 years ago, to just, just no pornography. Just like not, you know, just no pornography. Um, because I, I, I really started to feel like there was a desensitization that occurs from it where you can appreciate, you know, just everyday female beauty. And I think that it really does damaging things to the male mind. Um, if, especially if you make it a habit of, of looking at, at, at pornography. And I still feel like to this day, when you say that people think, Oh, are you like, a, are you a Puritan? Do you wear like the shoes with the little buckles on them? Whatever. It's like, I'm not a Puritan at all. I'm mean, sitting here talking about like hot chicks in the gym, but, but I do think that every, you know, that, that balance and context and, and understanding habits and what you're habituated to as a man is really important. And it's, and it's degrading too, I think. So for me, I went through large phases where I didn't, I, I didn't watch it. And then I would get in a bad phase and then I wouldn't watch it. And then I just gave it up once and for all, because I it just, not to be too crude, but I just, I think it's undignified to turn on a laptop and get yes. moisturized. It's just disgusting. You're like, yes. this is just like there there's, if there's a night and I'm eating a bag of chips on the couch, I'm just like, you're a disgusting person. You know, like, who are you? Like, and I'm, and I get up and, you know, th there's just the idea that if you're a man, you should have some kind of basic level of dignity and, you know, laying around with Pringles in your face. is just a gross way to live. And the same thing too is up oh, going to fire up the old laptop. That's gross, man. What, you don't want to live like that, right? You can, are capable of so much more. As a man. So how do you, uh, total, I totally agree with you, and I think that people on the right should feel um, more 
just, look, just people in general should feel, guys in general should feel more comfortable talking about how the, I think one of the ways that the apparatus tries to control you is, act, is actually through the desensitization of the 24-7 access to pornography and the normalization of that. Like, there's just, you know, for a long time, people forget there was more porn being watched on the internet than literally anything else. I mean, right? And again, I know it sounds like I'm like, you know, like church lady. Like, why are all the people watching the porn? It's like, no, that's not, that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say it's not good for the guys who are doing it as somebody who appreciates female beauty and, and thinks that, you know, having a, you know, having an attractive, uh, girlfriend or wife or whatever something that should be aspirational for men and you know attractiveness is in the eye of the beholder and all that and i get that too but um i i think that this is an area where there could be a lot a lot more done mike i i could talk to you for like three hours but i'm not quite at the level yet like uh like the rogan three hour long podcast so we're gonna have to have you back for another time um i just wanted what 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 it makes you feel positive about the future and that you think people should hear and then i want you to tell everybody where they should go to follow your work and just sort of see what you're what you're up to these days well what makes me feel positive about the future is always remember we just had the 100th anniversary of, well recently we had the the 100th anniversary of the end of world war 1 and i always encourage people to go read about that war and what our lives would have been like if we had been a draftable age and that in the Battle of Psalm and learn more and more and more about World War One. Do you have a favorite World makes... War One book? Yeah, Paul Fussell wrote a book. He also wrote a book class about it. And I forget the book title, but Paul Fussell's book on World War One is my mm-hmm. favorite because I sent a lot of poetry and a lot of the literary devices at the time. And the the death tolls are Staggering. literally incomprehensible. Staggering, what would it be yeah. like hundred thousand died right now? Well yeah. that happened. Day. There's 100,000 men dead. And that makes me optimistic. Also, why we have to make sure we don't bumble our way into it uh, with Russia and Ukraine yeah. because Ukraine, we'll, yeah. we, bumbled, we bumbled into it. So that is really, it's still the best time to be alive, man. All this, oh, there's a war on men, This, all that's true. You would still never, ever, ever have wanted to been born in another era because as a man, you can create your own destiny, right? I don't believe in, in living the life of a hedonist. But if you wanted to live the life of a Roman emperor as a man, you could. You could do that. And don't do that, guys. I don't think that's a good way to live, but you could. There's no, there's never been a time in the history of the world where you as a man can really choose your own adventure if you want to work for it. And every day I'm grateful. Because look at us. We're talking like this now. This would have been impossible. We'd have been working the fields as medieval peasants, right? Yeah. Just Instead, by accident. We're, we're hanging out talking and hundreds of thousands of people are going to hear our conversation, maybe benefit from it a little bit and and be able to say, you know, I learned something or I have a different perspective on things. And we didn't even have to leave our houses to do it. <laughs> it's really pretty crazy. It's a good time to life. And yeah. the people are able to listen. To so even if they have a job that's maybe a little bit boring, well, I had boring jobs too. And you didn't have pot. You had a portable CD player if you were lucky, a Walkman or something. So th- there's never been a better time to be alive, and people should recognize that. Where should they follow all things Cernovich? My Substack is pretty good, mikecernovich.substack.com, and then Twitter, at Cernovich. But the Substack, we're, we're doing things, very little politics there, much more culture, family, trying to steer things in a different direction. Awesome. Mike? Great talking to you, man. Ever since we hung out that time at the Trump Hotel, I figure we're going to be able to do a long form, and we'll have you back because there's a lot more I'm sure people, and I hope people will tell me what else they want you and me to talk about in the future um, and as this podcast continues to grow in addition to you know the radio show I do, which fortunately is rather uh, substantial. So we're going to keep, keep this going. Mike, thank you so much for your time, man. It was great to see you. Thanks, brother.